I know that tune. Oh, I bet you do. Hello, welcome to Integrity Live. Today we are talking to one of my musical heroes, and I'm very happy to say one of, a very, very good friend of mine, Del Brumman Stray. Del, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. You'll have to excuse me. I'm wearing this silly hat for um, a, a, an old friend of mine. Well, she's not that. Well, she is. Uh, I'm not. I won't go the old age bit. But I've known this lady. Her name's Pam, Pam Godfrey, and she uh, lives in in Australia. And she sent me because she knows I like a hat. She sent yeah, me yeah. this hat. Now I've known Pam going from way back in a well, when Stray first started, and. Um, through the power of Facebook, which we're on tonight, I managed to find her again, and uh, she sent me this lovely hat with guitars on it. So there you go. Well, when the show's finished, you haven't got to see it. It's going to be on YouTube, on Integrity YouTube channel, so she can you can send her the link and she can log yeah. on. And have yeah, she can have a look. Mind yeah. you, if, pa if Pam's like she was in the old days, she might still be up. <laughs> <laughs> Bless. <laughs> Here's a question for you then. Oh, I say. There's an album for you. And it's perfectly intact, Rob. I'm very impressed. Thank you. I've kept that up for a long time. A long time. How did the Stray story start, Del? Um, it was approximately just coming up to the summer, I think, of 1966. Uh, four of us, and I say all four of us, were at school at the time. That's myself, Gary Giles, Steve Gadd, and a chap called Steve Crutchley. And um, my recollection is, I mean, I'd already had it in my mind to, to have a band, because me and Steve had a, a little band for when we was about 13 years old with a, another lad called Alan Dennis playing drums and another friend of mine, Frankie Hackett, playing guitar. Um, but, um, they, they, you know, what you, what you like at school, it all kind of fizzled out a bit. And then I thought, we're going to have a, a serious one. And come 66, there was some seri seriously good music out there, and, and we wanted to play it. Play it. And um, we just were, as I say, my recollection was, we I could be wrong, but we were in the art room, and we said, you know, let, let's form a band. What should we call it, sort of thing. Um, and uh, we decided to get together. Steve, Steve Crutchley, we didn't actually know if he was a good drummer or not, really. We just knew he played drums. And uh, he came around the house, and we and we learned all the pop tunes of the day and all our favourite songs. You know, there was Beatles songs, Motown, all that kind of thing. And it seemed like almost immediately we went out and we were playing in the working men's clubs. Wow. And things like that, like 15, I mean, I mean, 15, Gary and Steve were slightly younger than me, so they, were, they would have been 15, uh, coming up to... 16 the following year, I would have been just coming up to 16. So, yeah, we were young and it was right. It was funny because uh, we had to borrow Richie Cole. Uh, no, at that time we went in different cars and I think we had, um, uh, I can't remember what car it was now. I think Gary's, I don't know, Gary's car maybe, but we, we used to get there somehow. And, uh, and then um, Steve Crutchley gave us the blow of, um, oh, his mum was going out with a chap who was a drummer in a trad jazz band. And um, they were due to go on Opportunity Knocks. Really? So he left us to go on Opportunity Knocks. So we needed a drummer. Well, Steve Gadd at the time, you know, as lots of young kids used to do, he had a Saturday job. And he said to me, he said, the, the, the kid who works with me on a Saturday, he plays drums. I don't know if he's any good. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then he said, oh, yeah, he's, he's rehearsing at St. Catherine's Hall with, with his band or whatever. And I said, well, that's only around the corner from me. I'll go and have a look. Well, I went round there and I sort of crept in the door and I could hear, I could hear this racket. <laughs> but it was a rather pleasant racket, I have to say. And I have to say, I was absolutely amazed. I mean, Richie was up there on this little stage playing this drum kit, and it was like like a bitzer, bits of this, bits of that. And he had it all draped in Union Jacks. And he had so much energy, he was doing all this, and it was it was about the closest thing I'd ever seen to Keith Moon. Wow. It was just so much energy. And and um 
I can't actually remember if, if I went up and spoke to him because I didn't want to sort of get the guys in the band thinking I was coming along to nick him, oh, which I was. Well, I didn't know if I was, but I decided I was. And um, so the next day I saw Steve, I said, that, at, at Richard, he's, he's, well, Richard, he's, he's, he's brilliant. We've got to ask him along. So um, at that time we used to, well, it wasn't until our first managers come along that we used to say we rehearsed. We used to practice in my mum and dad's front room. Well, it was like the, the typical uh, post-war council house, and they were really built. They were soundproofed. And we used to rehearse in the in what was called the dining room or the parlour, as it was. Yes. So we had, like, me and Gary had Elliot lamps. We had a, an amp uh, and a speaker with a mic, couple of mics in it. And the drummer used to go in the corner. Well... He came round, and it was the first time my mum had ever had to come in the front room and say, can you turn it down a bit? That, that, that new drummer of yours is loud, isn't he? So, uh, <laughs> but from really, from that moment on, that's correcting my previous statements about Steve Crutchy. That's really thinking about it, where we really started playing. All the working men's clubs, um, pubs all around the place. And, of course, we, was 15, we were still about 16 years old then. None of us could drive. And we thought, um, but Richie's dad had a building company, so we used to borrow his van, and we had two guys, Stan and John, who used to work in the butcher shop, and they were old. They were 21 and 22. Yeah, they were old. So they could drive the van in their days off. And that. So uh, for a little while, that happened. And then uh, we started playing. We did a couple of gigs, and this little agent, I mean, it's, it's stuff that... Uh, like a good film, actually. He looked like the little, at the time, little sixty Jewish agent. You know, I'll get you gigs. I'll get you gigs. But they were nearly all over East London, and uh, we did loads of gigs over there. Uh, and then we had something in the local paper, and out in the West Acton Gazette or something. And Peter, because Peter Amot and Ivan Mant came along then, and I think we were just coming up to seventeen. So we'd done an awful lot in a year. So by the time we were 17, we had a huge repertoire, including a few original ones. They came along. Um, and around the same time, Love Affair, who were only 17 years old, you know, they were a year, year, older, year older than us, sort of the same age. We were. They had come out. Small Faces were out. They were a couple of years older than us. And uh, it seemed the right time for like, boy bands. We were one of the first boy bands, Rob. You realise that? One of the first boy bands, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, so they uh, they actually got us uh, an audition with uh, Rick High Records, which is a bit of an irony because we went we actually signed with him properly about ten years later. But we had uh, um, uh, it was kind of a recording audition, and the producer was a very well known guy at the time called John Schroeder. He was having loads of hits, and uh, I think he produced the first couple of status quo one. But uh, I think he thought we were probably a bit too loud and a bit too edgy for him. We weren't, we, you know, we didn't quite fit the bill of the, of the pop band, really. And um, so that was okay, really. We, it's funny because, I mean, I guess these days in, in a different environment, you probably burst out in tears if you failed the audition. But uh, we just carried on because we were happy in our own school, we were playing away. But what actually happened there was um, Peter and Ivan got us into what were the up and coming, uh, like prog uh, clubs, blues rock sort of clubs, you know. And there was all these bands that we were playing with, on the, well, not playing with, but on the same bills as, you know, Uriah Heap and Status Quo and Genesis, most of which will become sort of almost household names these days, you know, but we're all the same, same sort of uh, circuit as all them. Uh, we were the, uh, I, think, I, know, I, think, I think he was going to ask me a question about this. I believe we were the youngest band to ever play around here. Oh, yeah. And that was funny because we, we thought we should look all psychedelic. You know, we had all these lovely clothes, you know, because we had a big light show and all our own, all, all our own equipment, you know, quite unusual at the time. And um, I remember we all had white satin frilly shirts. And funny enough, I saw a picture of Jimi Hendrix today with a red one, like the white one I had. And each of us had a different colour gold, gold velvet trousers. So uh, we looked very, very swell. Um, but that first Roundhouse show was supposed to have been the birds, the American birds headlining. Oh, 
right, yeah. They didn't turn up for whatever reason, I don't know. Because uh, we were really looking forward to that, you know, a couple of years before that, Mr. Tambourine Man was a huge hit. Yes, absolutely. Um, the original lineup of Deep Purple were on that night. Oh, wow. Love Sculpture were on that night. Because, uh, and uh, they just with Dave Edmonds, and they just had the uh, Sabre Dance as a hit record. That's right, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, well, we must have done something right, because we got invited back there a couple of times. And, I think the next time we played it, that was what really, for me, changed my whole viewpoint on where the band should go, in my opinion. Yeah. Because, as you know, I was a big traffic fan, and we'd done a we did a show with, with traffic and see women and that. And but on the second bill we were on, there were two bands the like of I'd never ever seen or heard before, and they were Spooky Tooth oh. and, and Family. Yeah, two great bands. And they were they were amazing. Both of those bands were amazing. And I and I and I stood on. I remember, I remember standing watching on the balcony at the round house, watching the pair of them. And I like I was spooky to had a great image when they turned up. I, thought, I want to look like that. I want to I want to stroll through like Luther Grosvenor. <laughs> uh, and I went out. I went out within the next week or two, and I bought Family in the Doll's House, and I bought the album Spooky Two. Hmm. Both of which are still some of my favourite albums today. You know, they've not dated at all. Love it. Yeah, I'm so, to... Anything else you want to ask? I can carry on all night. Don't you worry about that. Oh, it's great. It's great. I <laughs> saw Gary Wright supporting Peter Frampton, and he was brilliant then. Yeah. Uh, 76, 77, something that was. Yeah, Gary was good. Well, you're talking about the Roundhouse. I, I was in um, Belfast with uh, Richie Cole a little while ago and his daughter Charlie, and oh, he yeah. mentioned that when you played that, he said you thought you was outdone by the DJ it was Jeff Dexter, one of the most famous DJs at the time. Uh, well, that might be, I don't, I, I, he, he might be right. I don't really remember that. I mean, Jeff Dexter was a huge star in his in his own right. Um, uh, you know, he was the biggest DJ around at that time. There was there was two or three actually. I mean, at that time, Jeff Dexter was a big a big sort of club DJ. He was at around house. There was another guy, Andy Dunkley. Oh yeah, 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 and then uh, and then and you know I will blow our band's trumpet here. We actually gave Jerry Floyd his kind of first break. Wow! Because, uh, Jerry ended up being a, a really well-known DJ, particularly in London. He he spent most of his time at the Marquee Club. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, that was funny because I think somehow Peter Amy, our first manager, came across him, and. Uh, one of the things our managers did at the early days was we had a resident, we had our own residency every other Thursday at the Fishmonger's Arms were green. Green, oh, I've been there, yeah. And um, we used to get, uh, you know, we used to get different bands open up for us, but we had DJ Jerry Floyd. I remember the first couple of times that he turned up, all he had was, he, had, he turned up with like a Dan set record player and a box of albums that he turned like that he had no nothing to plug it into so we used to put a microphone in front of the speaker oh, wow. the record player, and he put his records on like that but, and uh but you know he, he did all right but jeff dexter i've got a story about jeff dexter oh, um, go on. we played uh one of the first times we played the country club in hampstead all right yeah yeah and this would have been about 1969, maybe early 1970. And I remember what my, my favourite albums at the time was the first Crosby, Stills and Nash album. Mm. Yeah, that, that was, everyone was singing that and playing it. And uh, Jeff Dexter, when we arrived at the country club, he said to me, he said, oh, he said, um, I've just started to manage a band. I thought, oh, that's unusual for you, Jeff. He said, yeah, I've just started to manage a band. He said, uh, uh, they're going to open for you tonight, you know, because... Uh, they're actually all, all Americans, but um, I wanted to get them some gigs here, so they're going to open for you tonight. And uh, anyhow, these three guys with acoustic guitars borrowed our mics and, and played us there. And uh, I thought, yeah, they're pretty good, but they're pretty much like Crosby, Stills and Nash. Anyhow, that band turned out to be called America. Whatever happened to them? Off in their name. Yeah. 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 Because I've heard that story. <laughs> they still don't know the name. <laughs> no, they must have done. I mean, that was in the yeah, desert with me. 
And I didn't know what his daughter's name was. That's really stupid. Yeah. Anyway, I couldn't, couldn't get it back. It just ran off. Yeah. Because, oh, by the way, cheers. Oh, cheers. Thank you very much. Mm. I've got some medicine. Yeah. Yeah, because um, cause, uh, my friends, Miriam and uh, Miles Palmer, are, are actually filming the Jeff Dexter story at the moment. Oh, so really? Quite, yeah, I've seen seen some of the clippings from it. It's really good. And I've managed to, to meet Jeff a few times. We, we used to call him the Milky Bell Kid. I hope don't yeah. know. Oh, I'll <laughs> ask him that next time I see him. I'll speak to no, him. No, don't tell him. No. <laughs> but, I think Miriam's watching this, so he'll know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, hey, Jeff. <laughs> you're in trouble now Dale. Yeah. Uh, before i ask you this next question i'm gonna ask you one more actually can you tell us a story about danny baker and queen and stray do you think i'm allowed i don't know i think so it's in his book isn't it? um okay I, I want to do the swear word but then i'll be polite that's it be polite yeah um some of you know some of you don't know danny used to I think he was about 17 years old and he uh, used to work in a record shop just off Oxford Street. And um, Oxford, that uh, particular shop, got quite well known for people in the, in the music business. A lot of record labels were kind of around there, Soho Square and all that sort of thing. And um, quite often, producers, engineers, even the bands themselves used to drop an acetate record of like the first copy. And quite often people used to come in the manager of the shop he was kind of influential and in as much as people would go in there to see what he was playing well anyway danny tells the story of we was um he was in the shop one day and he said these four blokes walk in walked in and uh they, they said something like um we'd like you to play our record we'd like you to play our record we're going to be big you know so danny said oh yeah okay then uh, okay, I'll, I'll put it on. So apparently, Danny put this band's record on, and as it's playing, Danny goes, "Yeah, yeah, 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 I like it. It's quite good. Remi reminds me of Stray, actually." And of course, the singer, whose name was Freddie, <laughs> turned around and said, "Stray, Stray, they're a fucking." Uh, pub band. So Danny said something to the effect of, well, you might think they're a pub band, but I like them. Yeah. At which point, the manager of the shop comes out the back and said, Danny, what is that in row? <laughs> I didn't say the F word, in no. row. Uh, at which point, um, the, uh, the four band members, which turned out to be Queen, walked out of the shop leaving their acetate behind and Danny always said he wished he'd have kept it because it would have been pro probably worth a lot of money. But the, the other funny story he's got was Freddie had been shopping and he left a carrier bag on the floor in the shop because they, walk, they walked out in disgust. Yeah. And he, he picked the um, he picked the bag up and inside it was a rather nice Chinese or Japanese dressing gown and it had uh, an inscription on the, on the, the chest and uh, he never thought anything of it. He just thought, this is really smart. I'm, I'm, look, he's amazing, this. Yeah. And of course, um, um, uh, the, uh, the manager of the shop was gay, and so were all his friends who used to come in. And Danny was a, a young, good looking 17 year old, and of course, oh, they all used to come in, and they'd go, oh, hello, Danny. Uh, uh, and he didn't realize until sometime afterwards that a, a Japanese person told him that what it said on his just was queen <laughs> poor old danny oh yeah that was, it was i actually met up with danny baker about 18 months ago i went along to see his one man show two years two years ago and that was a real funny experience because i went to this old theater in northampton and uh, i went around to the box office and i said to the commissioner who was a lady and it you know even she must have been employed from 1945 so I went in there. I said, "Oh, well, I've come around to see to see Danny." This was after the show. She said, "May I ask who's who's calling?" I said, "Yeah, if you could tell me this, this Del Bromham from the, from the band Stray." Said, One moment, please. And uh, she went away, and she came back. She said, "Yes, Danny will see you now." 
really bizarre. It's like saying one of those old British films, Evening Comedy. Yeah. We, we get to, we go all around the back passages of the uh, of the theatre, and she knocks on the dressing room door, and she opens the door, and he, this voice says, like, "Come in," and she went, "Mr. Baker, it's Del Brummam from Stray to see you." As so I, she's opened the door for me, I walked in the door. And, and Danny's standing there singing All In Your Mind to me. No. <laughs> He's singing All In Your Mind. So I had to join in with him. So the two of us were singing All In Your Mind in his dressing room, accompanied, no less, by the Reverend Richard Coles. Oh, was there right. <laughs> He was in there as well. Hilarious. Yeah. Another, a, a few other acting uh, acting notabilities as well. But uh, it was really funny. We had a few pictures taken. We spots a few stories, but... Um, no, a funny, funny bloke. His, his show is worth, worth a watch if he, if he does it again. He goes on for quite a while, doesn't he, Danny Baker? It's not a short show, no, is it? He would give Ken Dodd a run for his money. <laughs> no, nobody can give Ken Dodd a run. No, I could. No, I no, I, he, he, did. he, he started, at, uh, I think it was 8 o'clock, and he was just chatting away, and it was really interesting. Bit, and obviously, I could relate to some of it because we were the sort of same age. Uh, we had about a 20 minute break. And then he started off again, and it must have been about ten past eleven when he finished. So he was on. He was going for about three hours. Excellent. I don't know how people talk. Then. I don't know how people talk. Then. That's you, right? I, I don't understand that either myself. So, who were your musical heroes growing up, Dale? Is there some the Beatles. Good names, Beatles. Yep. Yeah. Um, I got. Oh, <laughs> you're up in the boat. <laughs> but primarily the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Um, I've told this story before, but um, I went. Uh, I used to go to Saturday morning pictures at uh, the Savoy in East Acton, where I was brought up, and then that turned, then that turned into a bowling alley. So um, they were doing Saturday morning pictures, and I think it was the Hammersmith Odeon of all places. Um, and I went to the Hammersmith Odeon one morning, and. It was somebody like Alan Freeman or somebody like that was doing uh, Hi There Pop because, and it was, um, I think, the effect of uh, up and coming beat groups of the 60s. Right. And um, there was various others, but the one I remember and that stuck in my mind were the Spencer Davis group featuring the 15 year old Steve Wim Stevie Winwood. Wow. And it just blew me away. I thought, I want to do that. Uh, and then as time went, I mean, not long after I went out and got, um, I got uh, a Spencer Davis album, which was, which is the very first Spencer Davis album. In the following year, when the problem we met, it was the album Autumn 66 came out, which uh, is still one of my favorite albums. I mean, you know, hearing like a 16, 17 year old seeing Georgia on my mind and or, nobody knows you when you're down there, all these sort of things, just incredible. And uh, just absolutely gobsmacked with, with Wimwood. Um, yeah. A couple of years later, um, I think I would have been about 17 and he would have probably been about 19. And it would have been one of the last set of shows he did with Traffic before Blind Faith. Stray were asked if we would open for Traffic at the California Ballroom. Well, wow. I'm, I, I, I don't really get nervous, never have done. And I'm never, as you know, short stuck for words. But I met Steve Winwood, and I just was a, blib, a blubbering mess. I said, yeah. it was, <laughs> all the things I wanted to say, I yeah. couldn't say a thing. And watching Winwood play was one of the most amazing things I can ever remember. You know, I'm, I'm watching this huge talent on there, fantastic mm. voice, playing some really good guitar, playing Hammond, all, and I was as close as I could get to him on the Hammond. You know, uh, and you know he, he's he's never let me down. You know I've been to see him solo many times over the years, and he still he still changes. He does different things. Still good. Uh, so yeah, so the Beatles, uh, Hendrix, the very special musicians who actually are, are heroes of mine who play for Motown. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I was and Motown stacks Atlantic. I mean me and Stephen Barry. How we got into being stray and doing the sort of music, I'll never know. Because really, we should have been the average white band. Yeah. Because really. yeah. we we were really into. We wanted to, we wanted to make pop tunes. We we were 
we were we were mods really you grew our hair long <laughs> that's what happened well i'm glad you did do what you're doing because i've had some great nights watching watching you in concert you as a solo artist as well as stray so with my mate malcolm oh malcolm <laughs> in state, bless him oh you yeah. tell me an interesting story about him and our oh, pyrotechnics, yeah. our pyrotechnics guy oh yeah i was going to tell you i talked to you about that because <laughs> Next question is going to be about this is Bob. He's going to tell you all about it now. <laughs> I'm over that side, <laughs> the other side. I'm all, she's all fracked to bum. <laughs> it's um, yeah, because uh, I was going to ask you about Kiss and Rush, two of my other favorite bands. Um, but when you when you played with Kiss, Malcolm went along to see that and he's sit, standing there, side of the stage, watching you on stage. And he's in them days, you could smoke almost anywhere and he's smoking away chatting watching you and some bloke shout out oi and he's looking around watching the band you know oi he's looking around what's going on here he's, what's going on? he's, a, oi. And he's looked down there's a guy downstairs wearing a flying helmet anyway <laughs> are you smoker said, yeah, i'm watching stray i'm all right i'm just having a smoke watching stray he said i'm packing explosives down here that <laughs> <laughs> uh, wasn't one of our, our guys it was one of their guys must have been doing it because uh, we didn't use any pyros on that tour funnily enough oh, which, which was amazing well, with the well it, it, that was the irony of all that because because we were so young we couldn't we, we couldn't sort of win with the press at the time you know we were so young and uh, we were doing quite quite well in the early days and i think there were loads in the press who actually resented the fact that we were doing we're doing good for young kids, and young kids don't really have any credibility with you know in the musical fraternity. So there was always this sort of little begrudging. Um, well, they only they, they only go down well at gigs because of they got a great light show and they got pyrotechnics. So then when. Uh, Wolf Pine took over managing us. He said, "Well, okay, just concentrate on the music. So um, let the music speak for itself. You can drop the pyros." And we thought, "Oh, that was all part of our act." But we thought, "Okay, we'll drop it." And then blow me down when Madanza's album came out, and we started doing some gigs. <laughs> the press then said, "Oh yeah, but they're not as good now. They've done use the pyrotechnics and." The <laughs> You, you just can't please anybody so you know, uh, but you know it, it's funny i mean these days if, if you're young it's 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 a kind of a bonus but at that time we, we were found upon you know that we, we were we were we weren't even 20 years old and we were doing 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 pretty well you know i mean we we packed out clubs all over the place not north, north and south of the country and we was in europe a lot of the times if, if you could look at our itinerary for the first two or three years of 70s very, very rarely had a day off you know we were always doing something you know but uh, there you go you were always known as a touring band though weren't you as well I oh mean, yeah you use i don't know how you managed to record your albums because you was always on the road so we, well i mean that that once again was is all right by today's standards it's quite unbelievable because the first album for example um we went in uh and it was like going to work we go in at about 10 o'clock and finish at six and we made the album in a week wow and then sort of i don't know maybe about nine ten months later we started work on um suicide brilliant and it was pretty much the same thing all done in a week Saturday morning pictures mind you we had two successful albums so they gave us two weeks whoa okay. two weeks oh. yeah and god rest his soul um martin birch oh yeah uh he was uh engineer co-producer on that one so uh here's to you martin thanks for all the music you brought everybody he he, he do some great albums didn't he absolutely oh great. yeah i mean if, if you're a rock fan you've probably got you probably don't realize how many albums you've got that's got martin birch's name on it yeah and how he influential and helpful he was to the bands absolutely yeah. but no i mean uh, yeah but that kiss, that kiss story is funny yeah <laughs> when malcolm told me that i couldn't stop laughing bless him uh also what was it like touring with kiss because a lot well, of people didn't get on with them did they well it, it's really funny because um we we got on really well with them 
Um, we, we were very aware at the time that um, they were having problems with the drummer, the original drummer. That's right, yeah. Um, and we were also very aware that for most of the nights, Ace, Gene and um, Paul Stanley used to stand inside the stage and they definitely had their eye on Richie. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. And no one would have known because they had a, a stuck makeup on him and he could be anybody. Yeah. But, uh, but no, I mean, we got really well. The, the odd thing was that was um, we uh, didn't actually see them. We, we, we saw them do their sound check and we, we did our sound check. Um, as usual, they did the sound check first and we did ours. We didn't see them. And I can remember just as we were walking out to go from the dressing room, um, they, all, they appeared in full makeup, full stage clothes. You know, Gene Simmons was then about seven foot six. Yeah. And, you know, for a band who's supposed to be not very sociable, they made a point of coming out and saying, good luck, guys. That's nice. Have a good one. And I'll always remember that. And um, as the dates went on, we got to speak to them all, and they were really nice and friendly. Um, and what's really nice to know, I actually got a call. Um, I'm quite friendly with uh, Joe Elliott's other band, The Down and Outs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I know uh, Guy and Paul and Keith, who play with the choir boys as well. And uh, they were really chuffed because they called me from they were doing a gig at Sheffield City Hall this is a few years ago now and they were actually bowled over because they were in the dressing room and Gene Simmons came in and was talking to them and he was telling them how fond he was of Great Britain and how he remembers um, Stray being on their first UK tour and he said, oh, our mate, Bill Bond's our mate. You know, he said, oh, Cindy Mel regards, you know, he's a great guitar player and all this sort of thing. And I'm thinking, that's really good all those years on and you still, someone like that still remembers you, you know. Brilliant. Yeah, so, I mean, got on, got on really well with him. We've got no problems with him at all. Good. And what about Rush? Because I'm a huge fan of Rush. Seen Rush about seven, eight times. And my favourite one, I was talking to my mate about this uh, today, I went to see Rush do their um, 2112 tour. And when yeah. I got my ticket in the post, I used to get tickets in the post in them days. I opened the envelope, there's my ticket, and it said, Rush, uh, stop, uh, guest star Stray. And I went, Ah, oh, Stray are on. So I was more pleased <laughs> to see you than Rush. And I'm sorry, Rush, but I was. But that was a great tour as well. Yeah, once again, three very nice fellas. Yeah. And, and once again, you know, opening night, um, something I didn't expect. I mean, to be honest with you, um, what you've got to remember at that time, neither Kiss or Rush were talking 1976 and 1977 respectively. Yeah, they weren't that well known in the UK. Um, and um, John Curd, who was the promoter of straight music, he did, used to do a lot of the roundhouse shows that we did. Um, he was aware that we used to sell out most of the places. And no one would probably believe it now, but the, the fact of the matter is, if you ask John Curd, we got asked to do the shows because, <laughs> this sounds ridiculous, but we got asked to do the shows so that he could guarantee that Kiss and Rush would get an audience. Yeah. That's why we got asked to do the shows. He didn't want a half empty auditorium. He wanted to make sure there were plenty of people. Um, so, um, but going, going on, you're asking about Rush. They were really nice guys, and like the first night of Kiss coming up and wishing us good luck, we were in the dressing room, just, I don't know if we were waiting to go on or waiting to do our sound check. There's a knock on the door, and it's Neil Pert. Hi, guys. Oh, oh, hi, how you doing? I'm, I'm Neil. I'm the drummer with Rush. Oh, yeah, nice to meet you. He said, yeah, he said, um, I used to come and see you at the Marquee. Did you? Yeah. I, I, I lived in Hammersmith for a while. And he said, no, I used to come and see you at the marquee. I could, I thought, oh, brilliant. Of course, now, you know, if you tell anybody this huge two-star drummer used to come and see you straight at the marquee, you'd be like, yeah, of course he did. But, yeah. you know, he, he did. And, and they were lovely blokes and, and great sense of humour. And it is really funny. Hmm. The, the last night of the tour, they invited us back to the hotel. Uh, I, think it was, I think it was in Liverpool, I think it was. And uh, we got back to the hotel, and it was, it was going to be a long drive home, but we thought, oh, we've, we've got to go back. And 
we've been sitting in a bar waiting and Geddy and Neil were there and they were going, where's Alex gone? And all of a sudden, Alex appeared um, and it could have been Freddie Starr. He had, um, I think he might have had Wellington boots on, shorts, <laughs> smoking jacket, his hair greased back, a pencil moustache, smoking um, cigarette in a cigarette holder, pretending to be German. Now, that's a warped sense of humour, and your face is frozen at the moment. I don't know if it's the shock of the story, but you've frozen up. Yeah, I'm trying to get myself back working again. Ah, uh, where you go? I'm, I'm still here. You keep talking, Dale. You keep talking. Well, so you've probably got posh gear. I've got all the double or trying, mine is. I think I'm back. You are? Yes, I've changed the webcam, yeah. That's better. Get me back now. Good. Look Look at, I got you. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry. Anyway, there's a few people have been uh, tuning in. You've got Anne Elliott Stevens. Oh, Simon, I know, man. Yeah, Simon Ronaldo. Have you heard of him? Yeah, he's uh, I call him fingers. Yeah, he's brilliant people. <laughs> He's amazing. You should, you should, you should hear the stuff we're doing at his house. He's got a really nice studio, and I'm not talking about someone who happens to have a, a tape recorder or a, a desk in their bedroom. This is a, he has a proper studio, and uh, we've been uh, we've started the new Stray album, which is the first one since Valhalla, and uh, the results we're getting out of there is fantastic. And he's he's playing some wonderful keyboard stuff. I mean, I used to do all the stuff uh, for the keys years ago in the old days but but simon you know he just wipes the floor with most people around he's great actually i saw it obviously i saw him with pearl hand revolver a couple of times as well yeah yeah brilliant band absolutely yeah brilliant. great band they are and there's someone you know watching as well becky boo hammond oh good old Beck. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good old becky yeah bless her. hello you all in there's a few other people watching as well can't give everybody a mention uh now, some of the, I've been to see you, obviously, lots of times, well over 150 times, which is great. Another 150 to go, at least. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, get, I get to see other bands as well. I mean, I saw The Damned a few times and that. And I'm talking backstage because my mate drum for them. And I was talking to uh, Captain Sensible, and I mentioned Straight, and his face lit up. I've done this <laughs> a few times when it, um, they mentioned you because you've toured with so many bands, haven't you? So many people. And you've influenced so many people. Uh, apparently, it's, it's a lovely compliment. Um, sure, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I spoke to Steve Harris yesterday, funnily enough. Oh, there you go. Yeah, he, he phoned me up yesterday, yesterday morning, for, for little chimwag. Yeah. Uh, He's but, uh, covered one of your songs. Pardon? Lauren covered one of your songs, didn't she? On her first album. Lauren did, yeah. Yeah, she did She did Come On Over, which was originally on the Stray Medanza's album. Right. Yeah. And um, also, yeah. Matt, before you go any further, my friend George at Moon Dance Records in Wolfram Cross, where I live, he, every time I go in there, he said, Rob, I just sold another Moon, um, Moon he can't say the word, he said, Moon, Moon, I said, Moon is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he's always plugging here, yeah? bless him. Yeah, he's a good lad. Yeah, so here, yeah. oh, there's a question I want to ask you. Uh, some people will know who this is. If I mention the name Bob Pike. Bob who? Height, can't he? Oh yeah, Bob. Yeah, big. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. Yes, you've got some great stories about him, apparently, when you toured with him. About, well, yeah, I mean, some of these stories that you know, a lot of people out there would have heard them quite a few times. I mean, we sometimes do a version of Leave It Out, and before we do Leave It Out, we do like a little tribute to Candy. Uh, we just do like a boogie, and I call it the Can Boogie. Yeah. And. Um, the, story, the, the basic story it is, I mean, we got on really well with them. And back in 1975, I think it was, we was in America and we did about four, as, a, as they do in America, they do three or four nights, you know, in, in gigs. It's not just like a one-off, they quite often do three or four nights. And we were doing about four nights, I think, in uh, Alex Cooley's Electric Ballroom, uh, Atlanta and Georgia, great big place. And uh, once again, we got on really well with them, with, with those guys. And uh, me and Bob, we were kind of, because of our um, um, our, our weights, shall we say, um, and size, 
uh, we have we'd always have like little sparring competitions with each other, and it's a shame because I've always said that um, in those days we never had the had mobile phones and nobody thought of taking a photograph of he and I uh, because. Um, you know, we used to wear Levi's, and on the back of your Levi's, it's got your waist size. Well, in 1975, well, I would have been 22, 23 years old coming up, and my waist size was 26. We noticed that on the back of Bob Height's waistband, it was 56. Wow. So he had a 56 waist, and I had a 26 waist. And, uh, and he used to, I remember we were sort of doing a sound check when they arrived one afternoon, and this big voice bellowed out something something to the effect of hey where's that little any english uh cockney bastard or something <laughs> in good humor it wasn't it wasn't an insult and i know of course then i'd heckle back at him saying it ever but uh, uh we had we had a good time we, there's another story i will tell you as well that um after one of the uh shows the guitarist at the time he wasn't with him very long but he used to collect um, old blues and Cajun records uh, on the road, and he had one of those little portable record players. And he said to us one night, "Hey, do you guys want to come back to my hotel room and play? I want to play some of my records I just purchased." So, so me and Richie said, "Yeah, okay, we'll go." So me and Richie went back to the hotel. And there, where we where we went, how we got there, I think we must have been in their car or something. Anyway, um. Uh, I'm not a smoker, right? But um, they he had this thing called a bong, a big glass thing with tubes in it. And he said, hey, if you'd like to have a little puff of this while we're listening to music. Well, me and Richie had a couple of puffs of this and we didn't know what was happening. So we decided it was probably time we got back to the hotel. So um, we called a taxi and um, the taxi arrived and uh, took us back to the hotel. So the next day, we're all sat around the table and uh, everyone, the guys were going, where did you get to last night? Oh, we went back to, what's his name's hotel, you know, listen to music and stuff. And we got a taxi back. And I think it was Bob Tallow who's our road at the time. She said, you got, you got a taxi? And we said, yeah. He said, you got a taxi back? Yeah. Here a minute. So he grabbed me by the arm took me to the front glass doors of the hotel and he said they're staying there and there was a hotel on the opposite side of the freeway we could have walked across the road <laughs> and thought, dumb english bastards and he, no. I don't know how much we played him either he probably took us up the freeway about 10 miles and back again and then probably charged us 50 dollars. i have no idea but you could see the hotel on the other side of the road <laughs> there you go. true story brilliant well, Anything else? Yeah, apart from a quick one, because we're running out of time, but a quick, a quick just a quick one, Mr. Mr. Mannering. <laughs> yeah, apart from working with Stray and some other little things you've done, solo albums. This is your latest solo album. Oh, I yeah. Because this is absolutely brilliant. I mean, all your albums are good, but this is great. And it's got a, a lot of meaning to this album, isn't it? Especially yes, the, sir, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir, yes. I must admit, when I finished it, I was... I was kind of, I actually thought I might get a real pan in from uh, the critics because I think, and I'm, you know, don't wish to be presumptuous, but I think at the time, I mean, I was, about two years ago, I actually started recording that. And I actually started thinking that there's going to be a lot of people out there are going to be expecting, like, possibly a big guitar album. They want the next Jimi Hendrix, they want the next Joe Bonamassa. But as you, well, no, I don't have to tell you. I've always been in a, a song man. I'm, I, it's the songs that are important, not the instrumentation. And um, and I'm the verses and choruses man. Like I said, I was brought up on the Beatles, on the Motown. Everything had a melody, verses and choruses. And um, so I wasn't sure how it was going to go down. My joy, other than the fact that some of the songs, as you quite rightly say, do mean something to me, my joy was that uh, some of the best reviews I've ever had in my career. Good. Yeah, which was really good. Yeah. Well, we better call it a day very shortly because um, there's a lot of things I, I could just go and talk to you for hours because it's just always good fun. Um, yeah. Last question. Oh, you know, 
just going back there, Rob, I will say I, could, I did sidetrack myself from the original question you asked me. A lot of, it, a lot of the white feather actually was kind of following the untimely passing of my, my eldest daughter, Zoe, and uh, the kind of effect it had um, on, on me and how it affects everybody when someone passes away, especially when they're your kids, because you don't it's in the wrong order. You know, you don't expect them to go before you. And uh, I just figured that, you know, I was okay recording it, actually. And um, it was another one of those songs where I thought, well, I want, I'm not the only person this has happened to. I want other people to, to benefit from it as well. And here's a song for us all, if you've been down that road. Yeah. Well, That's actually, I, I spoke to you earlier, and I've got Lynn Jackerman's new album today. And oh, I yeah. played it. There's one song in it which she sings because one of her band members from St. Judai. And there's a line on it that says white feather and i didn't know that until just a little while ago oh there you go how far is that i've to talked to you there. anyway but i i managed uh, obviously I, I was lucky to meet both your girls and lovely lovely girls so yeah yeah nice. and it's yeah, yeah great great memories and she you know zoe was, was doing really well she was living in australia yeah. uh, and um she uh you know probably takes after me as much as even through the bad times she had a sense of humor i could tell you loads of stories about her actually but uh I'd probably have that for another day absolutely <laughs> anyway last question we are called integrity so what does integrity mean to you Del? i um put it down to my mum and dad the way i was brought up actually um to respect people uh obviously treat people as you would like to be treated yourself Absolutely. um i mean <laughs> common sense i guess i mean my mum and dad really brought me up well i mean there was old school they had bad rules and, and things but they always had you know taught, taught me manners you know mm. uh, and i think manners are really important <laughs> you know <laughs> you but, I mean, you know, just just sort of it's respect for other people that that you 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 react with, you know. Unfortunately, I don't see an awful lot of that these days. And with this recent COVID crisis, I think a lot of people have shown their true colours. You know, they don't really give a, a monkey about anybody else. They just, you know, very true. Very just, true. You know, I'm all right, Jack. Sort of thing. You know, I'll yeah. do exactly what I want. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank you, Daryl, for giving us your time. I'd like to thank Richie, Gary, Steve. And Pete and Pete. Oh, Pete, I've got great memories of Pete. <laughs> and all the other members of Stray over the past. Pete, Mr. Rock and Roll. Pete, and Pete Mr. Mr. Rock and Roll is. Yeah. Bless him. We should, oh, we should have him on in one day. He'll have us in stitches. <laughs> everybody has been involved with Stray in the new lineup with uh, everybody there. Yeah, well, the new lineup, new lineup, Rob, I've got to, I've got to give him a. Yeah. A, a name check here because uh, this, out, this new album is going to be. I know I don't know what it's going to be called yet. But it's going to be great. Um, as, you, as we said, Simon Renardo is doing the keys. He's uh, way ahead on the production of it as well. Um, Carl Randall, my old mucker. Uh, he's probably the longest serving stay member now, funny enough, aside from me. <laughs> he's been playing drums and playing with me longer than anybody else has. Wow. He's a great uh, drummer. Yeah, Pete Dyer's back in the fold. Um, and also uh, and our new man, Colin Kempster, who's just added added something. He certainly something has. Something very special. And, and as you'll hear when you hear the album, the album's sounding really special at the moment. We've, we've got about three, we've got four tracks down, three of which are almost finished. And uh, more to come. Really excited about sort of playing that to everybody next year. Because it's going to be next year, I reckon, now. Brilliant. Well, let's hope everybody comes and sees you because when they get social distancing sorted out and anyway, because you've got a gig coming up in September, hopefully, haven't you, with Simon? Well yes, we have. Um, we've, got a, we've got a couple. I mean, um, uh, Paul Yukon, our, our, uh, um, our tour manager, agent, representative, um, all-round gentleman, um, he started asking uh, a few people last week if they're interested and he's had quite a bit of response. We'd, we're playing at, um, we're playing, oh, I can't remember the dates now. I've, I've got my little thing here. I think we're doing the Cabin Free House in London, Croydon, Rains Park. I think that's the 15th of uh, September. And we've got another one, I think, on the 5th of September up in Cannock. That's right. two I can think of. And it's so 
Isn't it first come first serve for the tickets because it's socially distanced? Unfortunately. Yeah, that, that's that's what's going to happen on a lot of these because because now they um they they've only got legally allowed only allowed to have limited people. Then he, he's got to do a ticket. You know, these venues have got to do a ticket thing. So I think he's only. I mean, the place holds a couple of hundred, but he's only he can only allow fifty in. Yeah, understand. It is what it is, and it's at least we're going to be playing to somebody. You know, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be. Doing talking pretty much like this, you and I talking, playing some songs. You know, I might chuck in a couple of covers of people that we liked. Um, uh, and if anyone's got any questions or answers, I'll probably ignore them. <laughs> well, all I can say is, Mr. Stanley Unwin, thank you very much. Oh, give me deep joy. Holly, Holly. <laughs> I'm going to find out now, but Del, I thank you so much. And as well, we ain't got time. Yeah, absolutely not. Another time. Talk to you later. All the best. Actually, bye, load. <laughs>